Okay, up next, Lauren Hom is a designer, letter, and educator, a self-proclaimed artist with a business brain. <coughs> she picked up hand, excuse me. <clears throat> she picked up hand lettering as a hobby while studying advertising at the SVA. Over the next few years, and thanks to the power of the internet, she leveraged a few clever passion projects into a thriving freelance lettering focused business. She plans on going to uh, she plans on going to a culinary school in the next year or so so she can expand her creative skill set and explore the intersection of graphic and culinary arts. Please welcome Lauren Holm, everyone. Hello. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to start presenting right away? <laughs> Sorry about that. I was like, oh, are we going to have some like on stage banter? But sorry, my nope. bad. <laughs> oh, good. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I've presented at a couple FITC events, and today I'll be sharing my tips on how to make share worthy work. Um, so, my background I basically got my start because of my work getting shared around the internet, and I hope to give some tips and wisdom on how you can infuse your work with the same things. When I was putting together this presentation, I was figuring out the title and I realized that the version two of this talk could also be called, your dream clients also scroll on their phones while they poop. And what I mean by that is people, even people who can give you opportunities, right? Like creative directors, people who work at brands, potential customers, we all pretty much are very online now and use our phones similarly. And so you wanna give yourself as many opportunities to get in front of people as possible. So I really do believe that, you know, the old adage of needing to get your foot in the door in the creative industry, it used to mean that you had to go to an art school and like network with teachers or, you know, send cold emails or pitches or your book, right? To an actual physical agency and try to get your foot in the door. But nowadays, I think that getting your work on the screen, the right screens, is the modern equivalent because we're all on our phones a lot of the time and you really never know when someone is going to stumble across your work and not even someone who can give you one of those opportunities, but somebody who might be roommates with or best friends with or the sibling of someone who works at one of your dream client brands someday, or someone who is in like looking for something, looking for a service that you currently provide. So people getting in front of the right people who know the right people can be super powerful. And now, yeah, in this day and age, I hate to break it to you, but no one really cares how talented or hardworking or brilliant you are if nobody knows who you are. And I have a background in creative advertising. I went to school for that. I ended up burning out of my job and now I do lettering and illustration. But these marketing skills that I have and kind of having my brain on that for so long allowed me to start thinking about how I could share my work and get the word out about my lettering and illustration versus making ads for big brands. Nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I think that knowing how to share your work is or get your work circulating is such an such a powerful skill because nowadays, again, we're online, there's a lot of stuff coming at us. And so getting your work shared and not just like going viral or like trending in a hashtag, but really connecting with people and having them be champions of your work. Word of mouth marketing is so important and so powerful. It can outshine any algorithm like your explore, think of your explore page, right? On Instagram, you might stumble across something really cool there, but if your best friend texts you and says, oh my gosh, you have to see this, that's a lot more powerful and that's a bigger vouch for your work. That person's way more likely to go check it out and connect with it. So this might sound a little bit ironic for those of you who know my work, uh, you know that my motto is work hard, snack often. So as someone who has work hard in her motto, this is gonna sound weird to hear, but I really do think that the secret to being successful in maybe any industry or in business is to know when to work hard and also know when to be lazy. So one thing I've been trying to lean into lately is being okay with being lazy in certain areas and reframing lazy as from a bad thing to actually a good thing. We can't be blasting at like 100 miles an hour, right? Or 100% on every cylinder at all times. And most creative people I know, if given the choice, right? Like you have a finite amount of time during the day to work on your creative stuff, you'd rather 
spend that time making stuff than trying to market it. Unless you're a big marketing nerd, I, I am to some extent, but I'm coming at this from the lens of if you're a creative visual artist, just any person who makes stuff, you probably enjoy making that stuff more than you like promoting it or getting it out there, which is why I'm really into this concept I've coined called lazy marketing, where because of the internet, so let's say that you have, you know, you have to go to work for eight hours, you then have to sleep for eight-ish hours, and then you have the other eight hours to work on creative projects, relax, whatever you want. You have a finite amount of time to work. And so the internet, though, is working 24-7. Therefore, your work can get shared while you're doing other stuff. So that's the potency and the power of making work that gets shared because it can be circulating while you're eating dinner or while you're hanging out or while you're working on something, you know, getting into a new creative hobby or something. So what makes something shareworthy? And I really do want to define too shareworthy. Uh, it is not necessarily going viral, right? I'm, I'm not giving this presentation to you with the hopes that your work is going to go viral. If it happens to, cool. It just kind of speeds up the process of kind of a domino effect, you can think of it, where somebody discovers your work, shares it with somebody else, and then they share it with other people. Maybe it goes to someone who has a bigger audience or who can connect you with the right person. But making your work shareworthy really just means making work that connects with someone to the point that they can relate to it or they find it interesting or helpful, that they feel compelled to spread the message and share it with somebody else. So I've spent the last decade launching different kinds of passion projects, making personal work, publishing it on the internet, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback and I've just been paying attention to what gets shared and I've distilled it down into the three most potent or powerful things or techniques you can use in your work to infuse it with that shareability or shareworthiness. And the first one is relatability. And so what do I mean by relatable? So you can't be relatable to everybody. I want to preface this, of course, because um, if you try to be relatable to everybody, you'll end up making really vanilla, boring work that maybe is relatable to everybody, right? Like everybody eats, everybody sleeps, like everybody breathes air. It doesn't make it super interesting. So instead of trying to be relatable to everyone, you should think about who do I want to be relatable to? Maybe it's, you know, potential clients in a certain industry, or maybe if you sell prints of your art and it's in a certain genre of art, you want to appeal to fans of a certain aesthetic. For me, the easiest way to approach this has always been using myself and my friends as the who do I want to be relatable to, because as an extrovert and someone who likes to connect with people, for me, I like to make work that relates to people who are like me and people who have a similar sense of humor, people who are interested in the same things. It doesn't mean you have to do it this way, but I found that this is the most organic way to make relatable work is to start with what you already know, what your friends already know, because likely what's relatable to you and your friend, like what's relatable to you is also relatable to your friends. That's probably why you became friends in the first place, right? So my best friend in college, we became good friends because we were at a party like a couple months into school. And it had just kind of been, you know, friendly kind of small talk before that. And we got drunk at a party and one of us had mentioned that we really liked emo music, uh, like pop punk from the early 2000s. And we had this light bulb moment where that was like this bright point of connection for us where it broke down that barrier. And I was like, wait, really? You too? Like me too? And we ended up chatting and going deeper and becoming friends. We've been friends for over a decade now. And you can do that with your work. So I wanna show you an example. So one of my very first projects was called Daily Dishonesty. And this is a good example of one of those relatable projects. The impetus for this project was I was with my friends, right? And we were talking and I realized that we lied to each other all the time, like little white lies. And I was maybe 20, one at the time. And so I started hand lettering these little white lies that made my girlfriends laugh that we could relate to and publishing them on a Tumblr blog. And this started to circulate around the internet so much to the point where, and I had, I had no intention of it going viral or it getting spread all over the internet because I was just trying to make something for me and my friends, kind of like a little gift for us. 
And it turned into this big thing. It started circulating. My work ended up getting, you know, reblogged re 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 on uh, Tumblr and then pinned on Pinterest, written up on design blogs. And eventually it turned into me landing a book deal because a literary agent was scrolling on Pinterest one day and stumbled across my work. And I do want to point out too that I didn't have a Pinterest account at this time. So someone else had pinned my work and I don't know who that person was, but it got it in front of my literary agent and I ended up selling it into a book. Another way to think about making relatable work is, you know, other things that are going on in your life, right? So with Daily Dishonesty, it was about this kind of common thread of like, I do that too, or like, I'm feeling this too. This one is more of like a negative thing. So I went through a breakup and I ended up being a little bit salty about it. It wasn't a good breakup. And one day I put a post-it note on my water bottle. This is when I was still working full time. And it said ex-boyfriend tears on it. And people started walking by and laughing and they were like, that's really funny. And that was kind of a light bulb moment for me too. When someone else, whether it's your friends, coworkers, people who know you or people who are around you, tell you that something is funny to them or interesting to them, or they can relate to that, that's a really good indicator that hmm, maybe I should continue exploring that route if I want to infuse my work with more of this share worthiness. So I ended up turning this into an actual line of products. I made them into flasks and cups and mugs. And this got picked up on lots of different like creative blogs and Time Out New York wrote about it. And it just started circulating and relating with other people who were either going through breakups themselves because let's face it, for the most part, we've all gone through some sort of breakup. So it's not necessarily a universal feeling all the time, but most people can relate to some sort of heartbreak. And what I realized too, is that people were buying these ex-boyfriend tears flasks for their friends too, which made me realize that, oh, people who aren't going through heartbreak themselves know somebody who is, and they're buying this or sharing it with that person. And you can think of that, it works in the same way with your creative work. If Let's say if someone is friends with a creative director at a company and they mention to their friend that, oh yeah, we're looking for a photographer for this campaign. That seed is planted in that person's head. So if they stumble across your work, maybe they're gonna share it with that person. So I've booked projects where, I remember I was doing a project where I was lettering tote bags for this live event. And I asked the person who hired me how they found me. And it surprised me. She said so casually, she was like, oh, I just asked my roommate if she knew any letterers in Brooklyn. And it was that simple. And so maybe demystifying or taking off the pedestal what you think creative directors and people at brands, you know, marketing leads are doing to find work is a lot simpler than you think it is. And so that's why making share worthy work is super important too. So if you are unsure about how can I make relatable work, it can be really helpful to look inwards and look at your own sharing history for insight on what's relatable to you and your friends. So this could be hiding in your group texts with your friends, see what people share, look at DMs with people who are close to you, or even just DMs. If you have people DMing you memes or jokes or things, that could be a good indicator or what you are sharing with other people as well. Oftentimes I kind of, again, using myself, I will think about what are my interests? What are my hobbies? What's happened to me in the last couple months that got a reaction out of me or made me think, um, or what did I connect with other people on? This can be a good starting point to think about what's relatable to me or who do I wanna be relatable to and kind of focus your brainstorming through that lens. Now, the second thing that makes for shareworthy work is surprise. So I know that a lot of times we're creatures of comfort and we would like to know that like things are going to work out, but some of the fun of life is not knowing what's around the corner. And you see this a lot with, you know, surprise endings or twists at the end of movies, or if you watch a lot of stand up comedy, which is a really great way to get inspiration for this type of brainstorming, you'll see how a comedian will be setting up a joke and take you down this kind of mundane path. And then the joke is funny because there's like a surprise twist or something you didn't expect. And this is a really great way to catch people's attention. So you can catch someone's attention by putting something out there that they're already interested in and that they like, but you can also catch someone's attention by catching them off guard and making them go like, oh, that's clever. Or like, I didn't expect that. So for example, you know, one way you can do this is to take something and put a twist on it. So the thing that's really powerful about this is you're taking something that's familiar or something that people know 
And you're just changing one little thing. So you're banking off of that familiarity, but then you're adding that delight when you change something small. So for example, I did a project a couple of years ago called Flower Crowns, and I was inspired by, you know, the music festival, Coachella, like typical flower crowns that people wear. And one of my other interests, I do like music. I have been to music festivals. I grew up in California, but one of my other interests is food, baking, cooking. Like Chris mentioned, I am going to go to culinary school in a couple of years. I'm so excited. And I decided to combine those two passions and put a little twist on, okay, people are used to seeing women wearing flower crowns. And how can I infuse this with my own kind of twist? I ended up making a bunch of crowns that were made out of things made of F-L-O-U-R. So cinnamon rolls, cupcakes, all of that good stuff. And I shared this to my Instagram account, which is typically hand lettering, but again, Lots of us have lots of interests and that's okay to share multiple things. So I shared this and nothing huge really came out of it. I didn't get a book deal. Like I didn't, nothing big came out of it, but I'd say it grew my Instagram following versus what people think about, oh, if I share content that's different than what I'm normally sharing or what people expect from me, then people are gonna unfollow. Maybe some people unfollowed, but I know I noticed my following grow over here or over that time. And at the same time too, people would reach out to me and tag their friends in the comments and just say that they really connected with this project. Or I have a lot of people who say that they found my work and fell in love with my lettering because of this project. So this was kind of a, you could think of it like a campaign that I made for myself telling people like, hey, this is what I'm interested in. And also kind of showed off of my photo styling skills and it was just honestly fun for me to make too, because that's, I think, one of the most underrated parts of making these projects is getting that creative fulfillment. Because a lot of times, whether you're full-time, a freelancer, running your own business, you have to do work for a client and you have these parameters and maybe things get changed or you get that like last minute piece of feedback and the concept changes completely. To have complete creative autonomy and control over a project is super empowering to me. And that's why I do these projects as well. So here's another version of this kind of project with surprise. So for those of you who know my work, you're familiar with this. For those of you who don't, it's not safe for work. So just like close your eyes for a minute if you are not down with that. But another way to add this surprise is to take opposites and combine them. So they don't have to be polar opposites, but again, it's kind of like the version two of that twist where you take something and two things that don't go together. So you can think about two of your interests, what I recommend is writing out all the things you're interested in and then try to combine them and see if there's any weird pairings. Similar to food, right? You need some contrast in there where it's like salty and sweet or like, oh, I didn't expect that mango would be really good with hot chili peppers, but oftentimes that contrast is what make food so beloved. So what I did was I was talking with friends one day and I kind of have a silly sense of humor and we were talking and I think someone made like a dick joke or something and I realized that okay I like food I like that kind of humor and that manifested into this project called Peen Cuisine where I made a food blog that was all about phallic food and so I kind of want to break this down I'm going to try to intellectualize a dick-shaped food blog but the reason that I think this concept worked well and it got picked up by Bustle and Cosmopolitan which are perfect media outlets for this right the reason this worked well conceptually is that What's your first association when you think of dick-shaped food? I think of like a bachelorette party or just kind of like silly, fun, like mostly bachelorette parties. And the aesthetic is usually hot pink or glitter and not really something that is, I don't wanna use the word trashy, but it's just, it's kind of that bachelorette party vibe where it's just supposed to be fun and silly. So I wanted to flip that on its head and turn this into like a Pinterest worthy, super light airy photography. This is all, these are all vegetarian recipes too. I probably could have pushed it even further by making it vegan. And I think that this really flipped it on its head and caught people off guard. I used to joke with people that the, my goal for the project was to make these images so, so beautiful and so cute that someone's conservative aunt might be scrolling on Pinterest and accidentally pin one of these to her cooking boards because she didn't realize it was phallic. So I made this cooking vlog, I took it really far and I had so much fun making it. It just made me laugh. People who connected with this project absolutely loved it. People who didn't connect with this project 
absolutely hated it. Maybe there were some neutral, some people who were neutral, but in general, I wasn't afraid to make a project like this because it's genuinely true to who I am. My friends thought it was super fucking funny. And like I mentioned at the beginning with the relatable thing, you're not trying to please everybody. You cannot please everybody. I think that there's a little voice in the back of our heads a lot of times where we can logically know, like, I don't have to be for everybody. But then deep in the back of our minds, we're like, but I do want everyone to like me. And I've had to go get over that in my career. It still comes like seeps back and forth. But making the work that you want to make is ultimately the most important thing, because that's what's going to build your portfolio in the right direction. That's what's going to get people into your orbit who are champions of your work and share it with their friends who also like this kind of stuff. Of course, friends don't always have the same taste, but in general, connect having that connection point, right? Where it's like, wait, you like this too? Or you think this is funny too? Is super, super powerful. So like I mentioned at the beginning, I think the most important part about the surprising concept is that the familiarity of the format, taking something that people already know, right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So something like flower crowns or something like, uh, you know, Pinteresty kind of cooking blog style images, that familiarity will help people understand your idea off the bat. They'll see something and go, oh, I've seen that before. But then when you add the twist or you flip it on its head, that will be the bit of surprise and delight. And that's what people will share. So I also want to talk about how oftentimes I think that people share like memes or content or art kind of as an expression of themselves. They're, when you share something, you're saying, hey, I like this, or hey, I think this is funny. And it's telling your audience, the person who shared it, that, hey, this is my taste or my sense of humor. And so when you make stuff for yourself, things that you think are funny, things that you're interested in, you're attracting like-minded people who are also going to share that with other like-minded people. You can kind of think of it too. I was thinking, trying to make this uh, analogy work, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it. So. You can also think of it like, I don't know if you have them where you are, but those drumstick ice cream cones <laughs> that are like vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream cone. But then the best part of the drumstick is that little surprise of the chocolate chip at the bottom. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'll stop talking about drumsticks now. But for those of you who do, that is kind of the surprise and delight that you can give people with your creative work. The third thing uh, is making things that are helpful things that are helpful just inherently get shared. And what do I mean by helpful? So this doesn't have, you, you don't have to save the world. You do not have to make something that's completely groundbreaking. The way that I like to start off with making helpful work is to think about your identities and think about your communities. So this might sound weird to say, but if you think of yourself, how would you describe yourself in hashtags, right? If you were, if you as a person were a social media post, what hashtags would you, would you use? So for me, there's lettering artist, there's Asian American, there's uh, you know world traveler, there's vegetarian. Like I find that hashtags though, you know, and labels though they shouldn't make up all of our identity can be a helpful jumping off place for thinking about, oh, what communities do I belong to or who am I and what kind of work can I make that appeals to other people who also fall into those categories? So for me, lettering artist is probably one of my biggest identities and the lettering community is one of my most beloved communities because I've been doing it for about a decade now. Therefore, I thought to myself, what could I make to help the lettering community to make their lives easier? Just something that's helpful. You don't have to make everything easier, just something. And so after years of teaching and talking with other letterers, I realized that one of the most difficult things for lettering artists is they love lettering, but when they sit down to think about what to letter, it oftentimes, you know, you, you draw a blank or you're like, I really want to practice, but I don't really want to letter live, love, laugh again, or a song lyric. There's nothing wrong with those things, but people oftentimes let the I, let the fear of not knowing what to letter stop them from practicing. So I decided to make a little microsite called What the Fuck Should I Letter? And I, me and my friends wrote all of these different kind of funny little quips and phrases that were just kind of an alternative, quirky version of what you might see from an inspirational quote website. So it's like a phrase generator, you click the button and it'll just keep spinning out different phrases. And this project 
got circulated around the lettering community a ton and people reach out to me all the time saying that they're super grateful for it. I started an Instagram account with it and it's just kind of my little gift to the lettering community. And you can think about your own communities and think about what might be helpful to them, right? So examine the needs of a community that you care about and belong to ideally, and then use your creativity to help or to make something that helps other people. You can kind of think of this as, what are some inside jokes we have? What are some pain points? What do I notice people in my industry or people who share a similar identity complain about all the time? That can be a really great starting point. Um, I once heard a quote from one of my first business coaches who said, or she said, uh, what was it? Oh, complaints are a low level way of saying or asking for what you really want. So the things that people complain about in your industry could be a really great jumping off point for or a brief, right, to make something, use your creativity to make something that helps people. And they're way more likely to share it if it's helpful, because guess what? Designers know other designers, letterers know other letterers, photographers know other photographers. And this can be a really great way to give back to your community. And depending on the kind of work you do too, position yourself as a leader or position yourself as a good community member who is giving back. So what do you do after you've been brainstorming and you come up with some ideas? Ideas on their own don't do much, right? You have to turn them into real things, you have to take action and you have to figure out how to package it. Most of us here are creative, right? And so we know that the way you brand something and pack package it up totally matters because when you're in the grocery store, right? Something that looks nice, like I know it's a joke that designers pick wine or pick food based on the labels, but it's true. And so figuring out how to package it up in a succinct and digestible way is super important. And what I encourage is whenever possible, work in a series for maximum sharing potential, since this is what this talk is all about. And so what do I mean by series? So with a series, instead of let's say you're like, ooh, like with my flower crowns project, it'd be fun to make a flower crown out of flour or bread. And I made one image and shared it to Instagram. Maybe that post would blow up. Maybe I'd get lucky with the algorithm. Maybe it would get shared to the right person. But the way I see passion projects is with that single, with that single post, there's only one shot that I'm taking to get that idea out there and see who it connects with. With a series, you can have a succinct way to say, okay, I'm gonna create five or 10 or 20, however many you have the bandwidth for or however far the idea can stretch. I'm gonna make all these pieces and I'm gonna keep publishing them consistently because with social media in particular, you never know who's gonna see your stuff, right? Like even if you have 100,000 followers, maybe 10 or 15% of your audience even sees the post. So by making a project that has multiple pieces, you're taking multiple shots or you could think of it as like at bats in baseball because oftentimes it takes a lot of at bats to get a home run. So I like to work in series because it allows me to focus my creativity, make a wider breadth of like portfolio piece, right? A more impressive portfolio piece, get my idea out there, and then also have multiple opportunities to catch the right people or different people at the right time and have them get to know my work or share it. Because yeah, that algorithm is always changing. We have no control over that. Therefore, infusing your work with these kind of shareable bits and then making multiples of it, I think is the most powerful strategy there. If you're stuck on how you can package up your project, right? You're like, oh, I really want to make a project about food and art and, you know, houseplants, whatever it may be, but you don't know how to package it up. You can borrow a framework from an existing series in the world. So I've noticed that there are series that are all around us all the time and we just don't really notice them because they're so normal. So I wanted to give you a couple ideas on how you can package your ideas up. So for example, what are series that already exist? Uh, like the ABCs of something or a glossary of terms. Like if you wanna make 26 pieces of something, then the ABCs are a really great format to filter your idea through. It's kind of the container that you put it in. You could redesign something. So like an existing framework could be the 50 states in the US or it could be the 12 days of Christmas or it could be you know, the 12 months in the year. You can kind of find those numerical structures and try to find one that either enhances your concept or complements your concept that you can kind of put your ideas into. Uh, instruction manuals, this is a really great way to kind of position your project. So maybe you're interested, 
I remember I saw a project years ago that was an instruction manual, like style illustration for how to take care of a baby. And they were, it was how to, it was how to take care of a baby and then how not to take care of a baby because the instruction manuals will often tell you what not to do as well. So you can think about your idea or your concept through that lens as well. And then similar to an instruction manual, you could do a survival guide or tips. Um, I remember there was an illustrator, I think it's Nathan Pyle who created a guide to walking in New York City or a guide to New York City and all the little quirks and things about living in New York, like you know, slow walkers walk here, fast walkers should walk here and kind of how to navigate the city and life in New York in general. So you can take your idea or the thing that you're, you're trying to relate to people about or something you're interested in and just package it up in one of these formats. There's so many more out there for you to discover, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a jumping off point as well. You can also completely make your own or maybe the idea you have already works well as a series. So the projects that I showed you today with the exception of Ex-Boyfriend Tears and Will Letter or Ex-Boyfriend Tears and What the Fuck Should I Letter is they're just series of different lettered phrases, right? Or just series of images of a similar concept. I'd like to think of passion projects as bite-sized ad campaigns for you. And this could mean an ad campaign that is, you know, uh, promoting something that you're interested in or telling the world, hey, I like this stuff. It's also showing the world what you can do creatively, right? These are my creative skill sets that I'm trying to promote. So you can think about positioning your passion project as what am I trying to promote and who am I trying to promote it to? And think of it as a targeted ad campaign for potential new clients or customers or followers, whatever you are looking to do with your creative career. And another thing I wanted to add is that you should care about the customers, not the critics. Because whenever I talk about this, I often get a little bit of pushback when I talk about making shareable work, shareworthy work, is that, ooh, but does that mean that I'm a sellout? Will other people think that I'm less of an artist or less of a creative because I'm trying to get my work shared? Like, does that make me a bad artist if I'm actively trying to make my work shared? I think that there's a misconception that to be a good artist or to be a you know successful or talented creative means that your work just gets discovered because you're just naturally so genius. And I don't think it works that way. I think that we're all overwhelmed by the amount of stuff coming our way online and that a good idea can really cut through the noise and connect with the right people who are gonna be hopefully lifelong fans of you and your creative work and your business. So people are going to have their opinions. You can't be relatable to everybody. Not everybody will agree with your work or that your message or your methods. But really, all you need are that core group of people who are going to support your work and hire you. And only you know the direction you want to take your career in and what you're comfortable with. I kind of like to think about this as like a, a recipe where at the end of a recipe, it'll say salt and pepper to taste. And that used to drive me nuts because I used to think like, why can't you just tell me exactly how much salt and pepper to put in? But the truth is it's up to each and every one of us to see, you know, what resonates with us, what strategies work and salt to taste, right? Figure out what works for you, what makes you feel good, what is working to get you new clients and new customers. So don't worry about what people who might criticize you say, because when it comes to creativity, you're not a sellout, like you're just being a smart artist. I think if you believe in your work and you believe in its ability to make the world more beautiful or share a powerful message, then you would want it to get shared by the maximum amount of people. And you can think of these tips as just, you know, seasonings or sauces that you can add to your, add to your work because I want to make sure that it's complementary to the work that you're doing already too. I don't want anyone to feel like they have to use certain techniques to like get their work out there if they don't if they don't feel aligned or they feel weird. And so take what you want from this and kind of pick and choose what works for you. And the truth is like there is no magic formula for what's going to get shared, but that shouldn't stop you from trying to find your specific recipe. So maybe you know, you are super self-aware and you know exactly what you're into and you know the direction you want to take your career in. Maybe you do a little bit of brainstorming about the relatable category, right? Maybe you have a silly sense of humor and, you know, you're the friend in the group who always sends the best memes, right, to the other people. Then maybe the surprising element is good for you because a lot of what I'm talking about is basically what meme culture is based off of. And I think we're all familiar with that. 
And so we can take bits and pieces of what we see working online, getting other things, getting other content shared and apply that to our own artwork and, you know, kind of find that happy medium between the kind of work that you love making and that feels good to you and that you're passionate about. And then also the kind of work and, and products and things that people want and are willing to pay for and need. And I really think that finding that sweet spot is the secret to building a successful creative business. And so, yeah, go out there, take what you will from this presentation, sprinkle it in, do a little bit of brainstorming and soul searching. And I hope that you find your recipe to making your work more share worthy because at the end of the day, I want you to be lazier with your marketing and to spend more time doing other things that you like to do and making your art. Thank you. Yay, yay, okay, all right, all right. If you're feeling uh, hungry or maybe horny, it's because <laughs> Lauren just served up a tasty, spicy presentation. Thank you so much, that was so awesome. Okay, let's get to Q&A, let's do that, okay? So audience, you know what to do, you know what time it is. Go ahead and drop in your questions and make sure you upvote the one that you want me to ask Lauren. So we'll give Lauren a chance to take a beverage, take a breath, okay, here Ooh. we go. Um, all right, this one's coming from our friend, Sean, Sean Pucknell. <laughs> He's asking this question. All right. No bias, no preferential treatment here. It was the highest voted thing. Any advice for creatives on how to use social media effectively without burning out on it? People get stuck on this all the time. Ooh, yes. So for me, this ties into, I guess, my presentation. I like to, I don't have a content calendar or anything. I tried one time and it just it fell off the rails anyways. The way I like to use social media is to kind of put things into buckets or containers. So with a passion project that doubles as a social media strategy for me because I have this project that's around a central theme that I can share maybe one per week, one every, every couple of days. And that passion project gives me like content or things to post for however long I have the project going for. And another thing I do as well is I will I will repost the shit out of old work. I think there's a, there's this there's this preconceived notion that holds people back, similar to the, the like, if I care about marketing, am I a sellout? There's a preconceived notion that everything you post on Instagram or Facebook, wherever it is, needs to be brand new, never before seen, like a brand new release. And I always tell my students, you have a backlog of work that maybe you're still really proud of. And even if you aren't proud of it, that can be social media as well, where you share old work and go, look how shitty this is. I'm so proud of how far I've come. There's so many stories you can tell about things that you already made. And so I repost the shit out of my work. And then the last tip I will give too is it's okay to set boundaries. I think, you know, Instagram with Insta being in the name kind of makes it feel constant. But one thing that for those of you who follow me, you may not even notice is I don't use social media on the weekends. I actually try to, I never post. And I also try not to use it and be on it from Saturday and Sunday because it's just a nice break. And there was a, when I made that decision, I was nervous that, oh, like, am I gonna lose engagement? Will people, there's that fear, right? That like, am I gonna be irrelevant? Will people, will people forget about me? And the answer is no, they won't. <laughs> and one thing I will say that I think can protect against any of that like algorithm anxiety too about being irrelevant or being you know shadow banned or pushed down by the algorithm is when you connect with people through your work and like I'm sure there are people in the audience who is who are like oh that pink cuisine project is really weird I don't know about this gal and there are people in the audience who were who probably spit out their coffee and laughed and want to text it to their friends now when so those people who laughed even if let's say they follow me after this and they get to know my work, even if let's say I fall out of their algorithm and they stop seeing my work, that seed is planted there because there is a connection. And maybe if they're talking with a friend or it'll just randomly pop up in your mind, right? Things get planted in our heads and we have no idea why they come back to us or come up. So I really think that that connection and word of mouth marketing can kind of outshine any algorithms that can come up in our lifetime because yeah, that's important to be able to, you know, know how to use hashtags and optimize your posts to be shared. But I guess my presentation, I wanted to come at it from a conceptual sharing angle, because I think that for me, that's where I really shine and thrive and like to put my energy. So yeah, I think those are my best tips, but everyone goes through some social media burnout. And I think the best thing too, is if you're feeling that inkling of social media burnout, 
just put down your phone. It's okay. The world won't forget about you. It's one thing that's been helpful for me is just realizing that I'm not that important <laughs> and the work I do matters, but my brother studied psychology and he told me about this thing called spotlight syndrome, where we think that when we trip and fall, right, we're embarrassed because we think other people saw us trip and fall. But if no one sees you trip and fall, then it's not necessarily embarrassing. So just realize that people care about you and your work, but not that much. So you can let yourself chill out. <laughs> yeah, everybody just chill out. It's social media. I haven't posted on Instagram in a month and a half. You'll be okay. I, yeah, for real. It's been a little while. Okay, let's uh, get into it. I would talk to you the whole time, but I would feel it's unfair because I'm going to ask the next question, okay? All right, so uh, this this question is coming from Elena. Um, Elena asks, I would really like to get into lettering, but I don't know where to start. Are there any good resources for how to learn lettering? Ooh, so for me, I got my start just, I whipped out a pad of graph paper and a pencil, and I just started trying to form letters. Um, I think that the thing I really like about lettering is the barrier to entry is so low. Like you can just get a pad of paper and a pencil and it's really not, uh, it's it's not expensive, right? Like I just got into ceramics and those the, the equipment for that and stuff is so pricey. Same with photography sometimes. So with lettering, I really think you can self-study if you have a small budget. There's also, I don't know, Skillshare, YouTube videos. There's plenty of resources out there. You can even you know, I have a lettering class. I'm not going to go into a big plug or anything. There's most of the letterers you follow online have either a class, um, whether it's their own or through a platform, or you can just self-study their work. My best tip, though, to be safe is to not, if you copy, don't post it. I think you can copy for practice, but posting it gets a little bit dicey. I, I've heard mixed feelings on this, where if Artists feel slighted if people post copies of their work, even if they give attribution. And then some artists feel okay with it. I'd say err on the side of caution and just if you're self-studying and you're copying, don't share it. But the way that I got started with lettering was just self-study. Um, and I think that taking a class or once things open back up, right, and we can go out safely, then you can sign up for an in-person lettering workshop. That's actually probably my best tip is, I think self-study online is really powerful and really great. It's really accessible. However, whenever I sign up for an in-person class, it ensures that I do the thing and I show up and I dedicate the time. So my best tip would be to try to go to an in-person class when you're able to, but it really just takes time and practice. Letter, the cool thing about lettering and design, I guess, and any creative practice is there are some general rules and parameters that you can learn to make your letters more legible or to make them better or more correct or more professional looking. But then once you know those rules, you can start to kind of bend and break them. Okay, I see we only have a minute 40 left. Ooh, I wanna ask you this question. This is coming from me, okay? How are you so you? You seem so effortless in embracing who you are. You're going to drop an F-bomb. You're going to you're gonna make cookies uh, in the shape of a penis and just be happy with that. How does one find that inner confidence? In a minute 22, can you tell us? Okay, 60 seconds or 80 seconds. Yeah. I, I really think it's come from, I'm going to give a shout out to my grandma and my dad and my mom. And just, I am very lucky to have come from a family that, told fart jokes and that cursed and that <laughs> kind of embraced embraced us like like my, my brother and I as be who you are it's okay um and I think that if you don't uh, and I know a lot of people who don't have that kind of support network and so I would say turn to your friends or try to find a community that embraces you for who you are I know there's that quote about like I wouldn't want to belong to any club that wouldn't want me as a member and I think that there is there's some truth to that where go to the rooms that you are wanted in. And I think surrounding myself with people who are like-minded, who laugh at the same things I laugh at, who like what I like has been so powerful because getting that validation from people that you like can be really powerful to make you say like, oh, I can do that or I can be like that. I think that's my best answer. <laughs> That is great. Look at that, Matthew. We're done on time. Okay. Awesome. Great job. Thanks, Lauren, for a great Q&A.